you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Galatians 5. This morning we're looking at verses 13 to 15, so a shorter passage. And we're talking about true freedom this morning. Galatians 5, 13 to 15. Paul says, For you were called to freedom, brethren, only... Do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Well, words like freedom, uh, liberty, personal rights, those are very popular words today, aren't they, in our country? Uh, the focus in our country today. There are many different groups out there that are canvassing it, that are advocating it, and so forth. And probably if you sat down with people and asked them, what does freedom mean to you? How do you define freedom? What comes to mind? You'd probably get a lot of different ideas, a lot of different thoughts on those terms, those words. People are demanding more freedom to do as they please probably than ever before. And in the name of personal rights, people scoff, many do, not everyone, at any kind of authority or any kind of restrictions that are placed on them. Reminds me of the Israelites in the days of the judges right? People want to do what's right in their own eyes. We sing about freedom in our national anthem, calling our land the land of the free. There's the uh, four freedoms, you'll remember, that were first advocated by President Roosevelt, which envisioned the kind of world that he wanted to see after the war. He spoke of freedom of speech and freedom of worship and freedom from want and freedom from fear. What's interesting, though, in our country is that for all of the focus on freedom, ours is also a day of unprecedented addictions. Addiction to alcohol, addiction to drugs, addiction to pornography, uh, addiction to prescription pills and so forth. Mary Ann Bell said that it's not freedom of choice people want so much as a license to sin. And what we see happening in America today and other parts of the world too is exactly what the Bible says is true of man in his fallen state. Jesus said in John 8, 34, that everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And later on in that same chapter, down in verse 36, he gives us the prescription for true freedom. He said, if therefore the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. And that's really the great manifesto of Christianity. It's also the theme of our study, of the, the whole book of Galatians. What President Roosevelt left out of his all-important speech to Congress was that man needs another freedom a fifth freedom. Fallen man needs to be set free from the tyranny and the shackles of his own nature, his fallen and sinful nature. And what Paul wants to tell us in our text 
is that only in Jesus Christ can we know true freedom. Paul's going to answer some basic questions for us this morning, such as, what sort of freedom is true freedom? What are the implications of true freedom, and does it include freedom from every kind of restraint and restriction? Now, to unfold for us the nature of true freedom, Paul begins by telling us what freedom does not mean. And then secondly, he's going to tell us what it does mean. That's our outline this morning. So first of all, we see what freedom does not mean. Look at the first part of verse 13. For you, brethren, were called to freedom. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Paul begins by telling us that freedom does not mean license for me to pander to or to indulge the flesh. Now he's making this statement partly in response to the accusation of the false teachers of his day. They said that since Paul rejected the law as a precondition to salvation, that he was advocating lawlessness. You know, that you could do whatever you want to do without restrictions. But Paul says no to that kind of thinking. Quite the opposite, he says that freedom does not mean you can allow your fallen nature just to run rampant. Christian freedom is not a means for satisfying the desires of the flesh. Rather, Paul tells us that freedom is the means for opposing those desires, desires that we still have as the redeemed, that run contrary to God's word and God's will. Al Martin summed it up nicely when he asked, what then is the nature of true liberty? Not being free to do anything you want to do, but in coming to the place where you delight in the performance of what you ought to do. Paul tells us the same thing when he says we're not to use our freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Look at the word opportunity in verse 13. It's from the Greek word aphormain. Aphormain was a word used in military context for a place from which an offensive was launched or a base of operations. It means a vantage ground or a pretext for something. Paul is telling us here that our freedom in Christ then is not to be a base of operation or a vantage ground for indulging our fleshly desires. Christian freedom is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. When someone becomes a Christian, he's set free for the first time in his life. He's set free from the dominance of his sin nature, bondage to it. He's enabled to obey God for the first time, to live in a way that he ought to live. He's no longer a slave, in Paul's words in Romans 6, to sin and unrighteousness. Now he's a bond servant to Christ. He's given power to walk in the truth of God's word. That's the sort of freedom that Christ offers us when he enters our lives, when he changes our hearts. And it's important for us to understand this. A biblical perspective on freedom. Because there's many people calling for freedom with a loud voice when in reality they really have no idea what freedom is. They speak of free love and free life and freedom of expression and so forth, all the while from a biblical standpoint being held captive by their own fallenness, their own appetites and lusts and so forth, just like we all are until Christ invades someone's life and 
changes our hearts. And so when a person moves from one form of what he thinks is freedom to another form of what he calls freedom, in reality, apart from Jesus Christ, they're simply moving from one form of bondage to another. And so we see, first of all, what Christian liberty or freedom does not mean. It does not mean an opportunity for the flesh. It doesn't mean I simply do as I please. Rather, it means that Christ has set me free from the bondage to my own sinful heart. He's given me the desire and the power to obey God's commands now, to live the way God wants me to live. Secondly, Paul tells us what freedom does mean. Look at the middle of verse 13 and following. But through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Now here Paul gives us three characteristics of true freedom, of Christian freedom. First of all, he says that freedom is freedom to serve others. But through love, he says, verse 13, serve one another. And here Paul gives us a description of the essence of true freedom. Christ sets us free, see, to become servants. To one another. Christian freedom, true freedom, is no more freedom to do as I please, irrespective of the good of my neighbor, of my fellow man, than it is to do as I please in indulging my flesh. It seems sort of paradoxical, doesn't it? From one point of view, we could say that true freedom is a form of slavery. Not slavery to my flesh, but slavery to my neighbor. We're free in our relation to God, and at the same time, we become slaves in relation to one another. The difference now is our motivation. Now we serve others because God has first loved us, and our service to one another is an expression of our love to God. It demonstrates our love to God. You remember John's words in his first epistle, 1 John 4, 2. How can we love God whom we have not seen if we can't love our brother whom we have seen? The way we show God we love him is the way we treat one another. Secondly, Christian freedom also means freedom to fulfill God's moral law. Look at verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, some people want to say that if we love one another, we can safely break God's law in the interest of love. That there may be times when I need to disobey God or break His law to display love towards someone else. But Paul says no. Rather, if we love one another, we fulfill the law. Christian freedom is not licensed to ignore God's desire for our holiness. Rather, it's the opportunity to fulfill it. Again, I quote this time from Augustine. He said this, There is no true liberty except the liberty of the happy who cleave to the eternal law. It's like the ordinance that God gave through Moses in Exodus 21, right after he'd given him the Ten Commandments. The ordinance said that if one Hebrew bought another Hebrew as a slave, the slave had to be freed after six years of serving his master. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, I will not go out as a free man, then his master shall bring him to God, then to the door, and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl, and he shall serve him permanently. The purpose of Christian freedom 
is for believers to do exactly as the Hebrew slave did, who permanently surrendered his freedom to the master whom he loved. We give up the freedom to serve ourselves, see, in order to willingly serve the Lord. Thirdly, Christian freedom not only means freedom to serve others and freedom to obey God's moral law, but it also means freedom to avoid harming others. Look at verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Now here Paul is expressing the negative side, really, of what he said in verse 13. Through love, we're to serve one another. Put negatively, we are not to bite and devour one another. And Paul's painting the picture here of a church or church members in the act of literally rushing at each other like wild animals, biting, devouring one another, gulping each other down, and if they persist they'll eventually be consumed. It's the picture of two snakes that grabbed each other by the tail and each swallowed the other. Or as Alan Cole put it in his commentary, two Kilkenny cats of Cromwellian times who fought so furiously that not a scrap of hair remained on either. Now, that's extreme, right? As Christians, we're, most of us, we're not involved in that kind of intense conflict. But what about things like slander? What about things like gossip? Speaking of others in a way that tears down and doesn't edify. Passing on a bad report that you heard. Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment that it may give grace to those who hear. Are we biting, devouring one another because of unbridled tongues? See, Christian freedom is not freedom to harm another brother or sister in the Lord. Well, let me close on a practical note. Let me ask us a diagnostic question. As a Christian, how do I know if I'm walking in the freedom that Christ has called me to? What will be distinctive about a person who understands the nature of his freedom in Christ and is walking in that freedom. Well, let me offer a few ideas. The first one is motivational. If you truly understand your freedom in Christ, then your motivation to do the things that you do, your service, won't be simply to satisfy a legal demand. In other words, you won't find yourself motivated to service because you've, you feel like you've got to keep God happy. And this is very practical. Understanding our freedom in Christ, see, it enables us to focus on people, doesn't it? And the person that we're trying to serve, rather than focusing on a task or a duty that we're trying to fulfill. Secondly, someone who's walking in his or her freedom in Christ won't let their actions be determined by what sort of response they get from other people. So they're not bent out of shape if they don't get an immediate thank you for something that they've done. And finally, people walking in freedom aren't evaluating everything they've done or contributed as if somehow their freedom depended on it. Instead, they realize that the freedom they have was a gift given to them 
by Christ and to act as a free man or woman is evidence that you yourself have been set free by Christ. And so you're not continually caught up in taking stock, seeing if you've done enough, that sort of thing. So we have a biblical perspective on freedom. And this text speaks very loudly to us today in light of what's going on in this country. We live in a time that rejects increasingly authority, demands freedom. <clears throat> and yet Paul tells us that it's only as a Christian that I can really know true freedom. It's the Christian for whom Christ died to set free. It's a Christian who's been called to a life of true freedom. And Christ offers such freedom to everyone who comes to him. He offers the freedom which is peace with God, the cleansing of a guilty conscience, the joy of of knowing that your sins have been forgiven and the freedom and the power to begin to obey God from the heart and to live life the way he intended for it to be lived. Have you been set free? Do you know what true freedom really is? If therefore the Son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Amen? Let's pray together. As our hearts are bowed, if you're hearing this message, do you feel a sense that you need to be set free? Have you come to Christ and truly been set free? Set free from bondage, the bondage of your own sinful habits and choices. He wants to set you free. He loves you and He will set you free. You can be set free right now. Just pray like this in your heart. Lord Jesus, will you come into my life and set me free? Set me free from the tyranny and the bondage of my sinful desires. Give me the gift of eternal life. Cleanse my conscience. And from this moment on, give me the power to live the way that you want me to live. Amen.